Hey, how's everybody doing today? I'm just checking my cameras here. Oh, I got a big hair on my hook. Looks good. All right. So, I'm going to get that hair off my hook. Ugh, terrible. Um, we'll wait for a couple of minutes before I start talking about stuff and just see who's here and it's a uh, it's a beautiful crisp day in Vermont. It's actually not crisp. It's warm today. It was cool in the morning. Not a cloud in the sky, bright blue sky, no smoke, no haze. Uh, the foliage is just starting to turn in Vermont, which seems a little late to me. But um, I hope that uh, all of you are enjoying some some nice nice fall weather. And if you're in the southern hemisphere i hope you're enjoying some nice uh spring weather and i hope things are things are starting to uh, bloom for you things are starting to die for us and i apologize my camera is hesitating for some reason i gotta my one camera i have to look into it and see what's going on it's probably some setting that i that i uh missed so um, anyway, 110 degrees in Austin, Texas, Thomas. I'm glad I'm not there. Woo, that's brutal. This time of year, that's brutal. Um, anyway, let's start. Let's start talking about fly time. So um, we're going to tie a tiny fly today. Um, a, a lot of people are afraid of tiny flies. Uh, tying tiny flies and fishing tiny flies. And nobody really likes to fish small stuff if, if they don't have to. Um, sometimes it's fun and, and it's, it's, it's certainly a challenge to, to tie in to fish these tiny flies. Uh, but you know, if you like to, if you like to fish for trout and you like to fish for trout under, under all kinds of conditions and you'll and you like to dry fly fish and, and not just you know throw a streamer or a nymph under a bobber out there then you're going to encounter a situation where um occasionally sometimes particularly in the fall the fish will get on these little bugs and uh to the exclusion of everything else at least the fish that are that are rising and sometimes that's most of them um so uh, what I'm going to tie today is a, is a little tiny pale olive fly. And I don't care where you live, uh, if, you, if you or where you fish. If you fish on a trout stream, at least in North America, I can't talk about the uh, southern hemisphere, but in the fall, you will see these tiny little olive flies. And I'm not sure... I'm not sure exactly what the species is. They're some sometimes they're trichoduns, sometimes they're cleons, sometimes they're pseudocleon. I don't I don't bother to key them out honestly, but they're, they're going to happen. Uh, you're going to see these little, and they're very skinny. Uh, they're uh, at at biggest a 22, and often a 20, a skinny 24, or even a 26. Um, I usually try to get away with it with a 22 whenever I can and only go to a 24 um, when when the fish refuse the the 22 but if you you know if you tie a nice sparse size 22 you can usually get away with it and I've seen these all over I've seen them I see them in Vermont I see them in New York I see them um, in Montana and Idaho um, I'm sure they're in California, but these little tiny fall olives, and it's often the only mayfly hatch in the fall. So, um, you know, it, it, it can be, it can be very important. Um, tying them isn't that hard, really. Tying them is not that difficult and fishing them is not that hard either. You know, people, people say, oh, I can't thread a, you know, I can't thread a size 22 fly onto the hook. Well, if you use the Orvis big eye hooks, if you tie your own, you should be using them for smaller flies. If you buy flies, uh, any Orvis fly size 16 and smaller is going to be tied on these big eye hooks. And they're actually a, a little bit oversized eye compared to most dry fly hooks. And threading, a, threading 6 or 7X onto a 22 is no really no harder than threading uh, 5X into a size 14. It's the same 
relationship between what you're poking into the hole and the hole itself. So um, the one thing both for both for fishing and tying small flies is you need good vision and good light. Um, you know, if, if you're struggling with your near vision, you need to do something about it. And it's not that hard to correct. Uh, you can buy a pair of magnifying readers and get the strongest ones, get three X, three diopters, three X if you can uh, for fishing. Um, but you need to be able to focus closely and you need a lot of light. Um, so for tying, for tying these tiny flies, throw as much light as you possibly can on your flies uh, from, uh, from as many angles as you can. If you look behind me here, I've got this, I've got this little um, LED light. I can't even remember where I bought it. It wasn't very expensive, but it's got two, it's got two LEDs. And they're very bright. And what I can do is I can, I can uh, put one above the fly and then put another one in front of the fly so that when I'm, when I'm tying, I don't get any shadows on the fly and, and I can really see in there well. So I'm going to turn that off. So uh, you need good light and you need good magnification. You got to have it. Um, they, they do sell magnifying glasses that, that, you, that are on a gooseneck that you can put in front of your uh, fly. I've never been able to get used to, to tying with those magnifying glasses. Some people use them. Um, but another trick, if you wear prescription glasses and you can't just go to the drugstore or whatever and buy a, a pair of readers, um, next time you go to the eye doctor, and this is what I've done, um, have them write you a prescription for focusing. Measure the distance between your front of your glasses and where you normally tie and tell them that you want a pair of glasses specifically, you want a prescription specifically for that distance. And then you can go, you know, go online and buy a cheap pair of frames and, and have that prescription filled. And um, then you'll have a, a good pair of, of close-up glasses for, for tying these things. And um, the other thing that you want to, uh, the other trick to tying these tiny flies is to use 12 O thread. Uh, the fly I'm going to tie today, if I tried to tie this with 8 O thread, um, it would, it would look really bulky and junky, but, uh, with 12 O thread, um, I, I can, I can tie the fly and keep it really neat, not have a lot of thread build up and still have plenty of strength for, for uh, what you're doing. Also, keep your small flies simple. They don't need to be complicated. You don't need ribs. You don't need a lot of fancy stuff. Um, the simpler, the better. In, in most cases, uh, for, for a dry fly or an emberger, you want a, a tails, a body, and a wing, um, and that's all. Uh, sometimes sometimes you can put hackle on them, but you don't have to because um, they'll float. The little tiny flies will float very well on their own without any additional help besides a little fly dressing. So anyway, um, will the lighting hurt when you use the black lights to dry the resin? Reason why I always turn off the lights. No, I don't think so, Joe. Um, th there may be a little UV in the, in the LEDs, but they're, they don't seem to affect the resin until I throw the UV light on there. Uh, any suggestions on sunglasses that are good for near and for RX? I need to see the fly on the water four feet. Yeah. Jorge, um, no. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, they, they do make uh, prescription polarized bifocals or progressives. They don't work very well. And the reason is that when you have sunglasses on, um, you lose some resolution. They do block some light. And you need that resolution for, for tying small flies on. So the, the best recommendation I can give you is put your sunglasses on a lanyard and then have a pair of close-up glasses also on a lanyard or somewhere near. And when you go to tie on um, a fly, take your sunglasses off, put the readers on. Uh, I've never seen, I've never seen a, a good combination of uh, 
you know, distance polarized glasses for fishing and, and close up. You really need to, you really need to um, have two different pairs of glasses or, uh, you know, you, you need, you need some other solution. I, I I've never seen where it works. Okay. So that's, um, and, and when I'm, when I'm tying these lights for photography, I have, I have tons of light. I throw a lot of light on because I have to, so that I can get good, um, you know, uh, good sharp picture for you. So, um, um, I got, I always got plenty of light when I'm tying that, tying this. All right. So, um, let's start tying this little tiny fly. So this is a size 22 and I'll turn it sideways for a second. And you can see that, that big eye hook. You can see it's a good size. It's a good diameter eye and you can even get a, you can even get a five X and possibly even a four X tippet through that eye if you wanted to. And sometimes when you're fishing for a big fish, you do need to go a little bit heavier on your tippet, even with these little tiny flies. So I'm going to tie on a 22. And uh, these flies, again, this little olive fly can be, can be tied as small as a 26 or a 28 if you want, just taking your time. So anyway, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my 12-0 thread, and I'm using pale yellow. <clears throat> and I'm also going to have a, uh, I'm also going to have a pale yellow, uh, or pale olive body. And I'm going to start my thread just back from the hook eye a little bit, but I'm not going to cut off my tag end. I'm just going to, I'm going to hold the tag end toward me a little bit and up and I'm gonna wind back till it's just a little bit under the bend. And I'm gonna leave that tag end sticking there. This is a tip uh, that I got from my nemesis, Tim Flagler, on how to split tails, because we're gonna split the tails on this fly. I'm gonna leave that hanging there. And then I'm gonna put in my tails. And there's two materials you can use for putting on tails. One is you can use what we call a spade hackle or tailing hackle. And these are found along the side of a hackle cape. Let me grab a hackle cape here. I'll show you where they're found. It's an old blue dun. So if you take a hackle cape, the spade feathers with the stiff tailing fibers are going to be found off to the sides here. And you can see they're kind of triangle shaped, but the, the hackle fibers there are very stiff and very long. So um, if you don't have hackle capes, you can buy uh, packages of tailing fibers. You can buy packages of these spade hackles. You can also use what are called fibbits or microfibbits. And I, uh, they're a synthetic, I think they're a nylon. And they're basically, uh, basically uh, I think they're paintbrush material. You could probably even use a really fine synthetic paintbrush uh, bristle to tie them. I don't like them because I find they're slippery and hard to deal with. But, um, but you can use fibbits as well for tails. But hackle fiber, I like hackle fiber. Uh, it, it's strong and it seems to... Uh, seems to hold up a fly. And the first thing you're going to do with these tail tailing fibers is just strip all the junk off the bottom, all the fluff and all that stuff, just to get it out of the way. And then you've got your nice tailing fibers up there. And then I like to use on these tiny flies between two and four fibers for the tail. Okay, you can um, 
You can use two, you can use four, you could use six if you want, but six is probably too many. And But you want an even number because you want them balanced on each side. So with this one, I'm just going to use two, two fibers. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll hold this hackle like this in my fingers. And then I will peel down and count the fibers. And I've got two there. I could go four if I wanted to, but let's just do two fibers here. And then I'm just going to pinch them and pluck them away from the stem. So now I've got those, those two little hackle fibers for my tails. And then I'll come back over to the fly, which I see has gotten out of focus for some reason. Must have bumped the camera. There we go. And I'm going to take those tailing fibers and I like to make the tails on these tiny flies a little longer than normal, so a little bit longer than the hook shank, just because it helps balance the fly. And I'm going to just Carefully attach them just ahead of that tag end to the top of the hook with about two turns of thread. And kind of work them back. I'm going to switch to my close-up glasses here. And then the best thing to do is just kind of raise them upright. Makes them, it makes it easier to split them. Raise them upright and just by hand kind of separate them. And then take that tag end of that thread and sneak it between those two until the tails are split evenly, about 90 degrees from each other, like so. And then take a turn of thread over that thread to lock it in place. You have to fuss with it a little bit and take a couple turns forward. Make sure your tails are split nicely. Looks okay. Trim off the extra piece of thread and the butts of the tails and wind forward to cover that stuff up. Go all the way to the eye and then come back about a third or so. And now, to keep those tails in place, get them exactly where you want them and you can... You can manipulate them a little bit till they go where you want them to go. They're not going exactly where I want them to go. As long as they're split, that's fine. The splitting of the tails helps to balance the fly on the water. And natural mayflies tails aren't exactly perfectly even either. So um, it's not going to matter that much. Get them where you want them. I like them right there. Take a little tiny drop of deep penetrating head cement, really thin, thin head cement, and just put a tiny drop right on top of them. And that'll keep them, that'll keep them in place. Don't think you want to use UV epoxy here. I think that uh, it's too thick for the most part. There's my, I'm not crazy about those tails, but they're okay. They're certainly gonna, gonna work. Okay. So next, I'm going to get my wing. 
And for the wing, you can use lots of things. You can use CDC. Uh, you can use a little tuft of marabou. Not very good, I don't think. Um, or you can use something, uh, a fine synthetic like this EP fiber, which I find to be really great. Uh, the stuff sheds water very quickly. It's very easy to tie in. And it's very, very durable. And it's very highly visible on the water. And you're going to want, you're going to want um, about a hook gap of this material, about a hook gap when it's compressed. And then just cut a little piece of that off. And even off both ends, it's gonna make it easier for you. You don't have any, don't have any extra fibers hanging off the end. It'll just make it easier when you're working with it. So now I've got a little, it's a little bunch actually a fairly large bunch looks larger than i need on a size 22 but it'll work it'll work well and then lay the bunch of fiber on top you can't see that very well can you I got my hand in the way i'm going to i'm going to lay this on top of the hook shank if I can do it, keep my fat fingers out of the way. Maybe if I do it from this direction, yeah. So well, first I'm going to just take a turn in one direction and put some tension on there. And then I'm going to pull this so that they're parallel or uh, 90 degrees to the hook shank. And then I'm going to go the other way around them. So it's going to end up looking like a spinner wing crosswise on the shank, like so. And then very carefully, being careful of those tails, pull it straight up like so. And again, very carefully with your bobbin, go around the base four times i'm just i'm just pushing this bobbin around the base of the wing so i'm posting the wing if you've ever ever done a parachute wing just be careful you don't catch these tails as you go around and now i've got a nice upright wing and to further secure it a little bit so it doesn't roll, I would take two tight turns in front of the wing and two tight turns behind it. That's going to keep this wing from rolling to one side or the other once you catch your first fish on it, which you will. And then just cut the wing off uh, about a shank length, maybe a little higher, like so. There's your wing. It's a nice, it's highly visible. Um, it doesn't absorb water. And uh, it looks like a mayfly wing. So it, uh, it works really well. And it's inexpensive uh, in the grand scheme of things. You're not using much material on there. Now I'm going to come back to about the middle of the abdomen, the middle of the body. And if you got any fibers sticking back, just trim them out of the way. Julia, do we have any questions so far? We do no have questions? one. We do have one question from Mark uh, asking, "What color variations do you use for the tail?" I, I don't care what color the tails are. That's the only question we have here. There okay. was um, yeah, the tails are so they're so small that it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. uh, these are blue done. Um, you know, gray, grayish, but you could use any color for the tails. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. And re related to color, Mike asked, uh, if you do a post on a small 22 or 24, do shy fish care what color it is or do they not see it? The post? 
Mm-hmm. I doubt if they care what color it is. I don't <laughs> think they're going to see much of it. Basically, what they're going to see from underneath is the tails and the body and a little bit of the wing. Um, and that's that's about all they're going to see. Okay. Um, and Joe's asking... The body, color, the body color is the most important. Okay. That's what the fish see most of. The body color is the most important. And I'll, I like to... Um, Put the Sorry, recipe. No, it's okay. I've put the recipe a couple times, but for those who have just joined us, I'm just going to add it here so you can have it for reference too. Okay. And this is sort of like an RS2 or a Comparadon. You know, it's just, I don't think this pattern has a, it's just one that I use and it's certainly not, nothing original, but it's what I use for these little tiny duns. It's durable, floats well, and um, I can see it. Um, now for oh we have one more yeah. question yeah actually, yeah a couple questions um, okay. these are interesting Joe's asking where you can purchase the fibers for the wing but I can put that in the chat uh, Thomas is asking or uh, Raphael's asking can cooking oil make it water repellent which I'm not sure I don't know I've never tried cooking oil okay. Um, and then Thomas is asking, what can you do to see a strike under slightly windy or highly reflective conditions with this? Since it's you can't, so okay, you don't, you okay. don't, you guess, you guess. Um, but the, the, the wing on this fly is fairly visible, which is why I use this material. Um, and but you're not going to always be able to see these little tiny flies, and you just have to hope that the fish that rose was to your fly and set the hook, but uh, often you're guessing. And anybody that tells you they can always see their fly is lying to you. For sure. Now, um, you could probably just use a thread body on this fly, um, but I like dubbing. It has a little bit of translucency and the little fibers in the dubbing also help the fly float. Uh, they trap air, they trap uh, fly dressing, and um, they help it float. So I like to, I like to use a dub body on this. But you need to use a very fine dubbing. Uh, so this would be rabbit fur, beaver fur, um, red fox. Uh, the but the synthetic the. Uh, the fine and dry or the specter blend dry fly dubbing or the ultra fine dubbing. These are all uh, very fine synthetics and um, you do need, you do need a really fine dubbing for this. So I'm using the specter blend dry fly and I'm using it in a pale olive color and take a little bit of this and I, I say I'm dubbing this but I'm actually not. I'm just gonna barely dirty the thread. Don't think of dubbing. Don't think of dubbing here. Think of just making your thread a little bit dirty with dubbing. And you want almost no taper to the body. These little olives have very little taper. They're really, really skinny. Um, they're just a little bit thicker up by the thorax. So what I'm gonna do with this dubbing is what I do is, is first of all, I like to I like to mix the mix the dubbing around so that the fibers are all kind of uh, going in all kinds of directions. And when I when I take this dubbing for the fly, I'm gonna I'm gonna just peel a little tiny bit off there. I mean, you can almost not see it in your fingers. That's the amount of dubbing you want. You have to be really really sparse with this. But again. If you think of just getting the thread dirty with the dubbing instead of instead of dubbing a body, uh, I think if you have that in mind, you may be better off. Okay, we, so, have, we have a couple more questions on that, Tom. Yeah. Um, could you use either new uh, new red New Zealand wool or Antron um, as a sub for the EP fiber? Uh, yes. For, okay. As a sub for the EP fiber, yeah, you could. Uh huh. Okay. And Antron's time... a little Antron's a little coarser, and so is the wool. So okay. the wing might not be as neat, but 
but it'll, it'll probably work fine. Yeah. And then I'll put the Antron in the, um, in the body too of the text or of the chat. Okay. And then, yeah. uh, Thomas is asking if you can use an indicator fly in front, like a small stimulator to help you see the strikes. Yeah, you can. Um, you can. Yeah. That, in, that introduces uh, a couple of problems and it's, it's not something that I like to do. And most guides that I know don't like to do it um, for a hatch situation because putting a bigger fly in front of the smaller fly does introduce an extra element of drag sometimes. And also there's a chance of foul hooking a fish if a uh, fish comes up for one fly and you've got two hooks dragging across the surface of the water. You can sometimes follow hook fish by accident. So I don't, I don't like to use two flies, um, but it, you can, if you want to, and you can't be as precise with, with these tiny flies, your casting use usually has to be super precise. And when you start introducing a second fly into your cast, it, it will degrade your accuracy. So um, I, I don't like to do it, but it, it, you can do it if you want. Okay, so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come over to the fly, and I'm going to show you how much I'm going to put on there. I don't know if you can see that, but it's just barely a little fuzz there. Almost like you, almost like you missed the thread. So you can see that I've just barely gotten that thread dirty with some dubbing. That's about all there is to it. And then come down and you, know, you may put too much on and then you have to remove some. Or you may not put enough on. You have to add a little bit. But I've tied a few of these, so I've probably got, a, got it about right. And put a lot of pressure on this dubbing. Really squeeze it on there. So it's you can barely see that dubbing on the thread, but it's enough. So you've stuck you've kind of you're kind of in the middle of the fly and you want to wind back and then hold on to your tails when you take that first turn of dubbing to make sure it doesn't knock them out of alignment. And just get that first turn right in front of the tails and then come forward. You can push your wing out of the way a little bit. Have your dubbing needle handy if you, for some reason, um, uh, bind under one of the wing fibers, you can just pick it out with your dubbing needle. And then pull the wing back and come up in front and build up a little bit of a head there with the dubbing. And that's the fly. That's the fly. Four turn whip finish and a drop of head cement. And you're done. Nice clean eye, you know, tying a fly this way. You don't have anything sticking out over the eye. Unless you put head cement in there. Always check, you know, after you after you put your head cement in there, always run a clean dubbing needle through the eye. Uh, let's see if I can steady this. Just a little bit of head cement on there. And then clean off your dubbing needle and then just poke it through the eye. Nothing worse than a small fly like this with uh, head cement in the eye. So... Um, that's what it looked like. I'd like to see those tails a little bit more split. I should have spent a little bit more time on them. Um, but uh, that's the baby. That's what the fish sees from underneath. You know, just the impression of a wing, that, that kind of kinky fiber uh, gives it the impression of movement when it's uh, floating down the stream. And the tails help stabilize it, and they look like mayfly tails. And uh, that's enough. It's enough to fool a fish when they're eating these little tiny bugs. And you can get these down to a very, very small size if you want.
So that is the tiny olive. Do we have any more questions? Um, we have a couple questions. Mark just asked, no hackle. Nope, don't need it. And then Roger Bird asked, uh, what about applying head cement to the thread before you whip finish? You know, I've heard of that technique before, Roger. It, 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 it gunks up my whip finisher with head cement. I'm not so sure I want to have to clean my whip finisher off every time. You could, I guess. But um, yeah, it, you know, don't don't make your you don't make your little flies complicated. Um, just simple. The simpler, the better. You could probably, honestly, often catch fish with just a little olive dubbing on a hook during this hatch. And yeah, Larry, you could you, you could just do a thread body, but it doesn't float as well. Um, that that dubbing holds the fly floating and um, traps air, little air bubbles. And um, so, yeah, you could do a thread body, but it, the fly isn't going to float quite as well. I don't think it's as, effect, as effective. Does it work in a martini? Yes, it does work in a martini. Just be careful that you don't swallow it. Uh, Joe, if you want to send me pick of the PMD that you made, uh, you can uh, post them to the Orvis Instagram page or the Orvis uh, Facebook page, and I'll see them. Thomas, you would not want to use GSP for this fly. 12-0 thread or smaller. GSP is way too thick. Um, I, I guess there's some really fine GSPs, but I, I wouldn't use GSP in this. I'd use standard 12-0 fly training thread. Uh, any other questions? Did I miss any, Julia? Tim, you would like to see the fly wet to show translucency? Tie one and put it in a glass of water. Uh, I have cherry juice here, but I can use that. It's going to stain it a little bit. There, now it's wet. You can see how that uh, that uh, EP fiber resists uh, resists matting when it's wet, which is why I like it. So even after you get it wet or you put fly floating on there, um, the wing will still hold it hold its shape. Not only will it hold its shape, but it'll be more visible to you on the water. How's that, Tim? Dipped in cherry juice. <laughs> No, no martini, Larry. Not this time of day for this boy. You guys want me drinking while I'm tying? Oh, that would be a disaster. Maybe I should do it for one of the Flagler tie-offs sometime. Maybe Tim and I should. Maybe Tim and I should do shots before we tie on the next one. He probably fake. He'd probably fake me out and do shots of water though. So that that Flagler, he's always trying to get me. Cherry is not a band additive, Tim. My uh, doctor recommends it. <laughs> oh, you guys like the idea of a drunken tie off, huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I'll have tie, to talk to tie Tim. On the rye. <laughs> huh? Tie, tie on the rye. Huh? Tie on the rye. <laughs> Well, that was a short one, and you know, it's it's uh, makes a good point that, that these tiny flies don't don't take that long. Um, you know, you do want to take your time, but once you get going on them, it's funny. Uh, you know, a, a twenty-two looks so small, but once you get used to tying them, um, they don't they don't look 
they don't look that small and don't look that hard. And then they say, ah, I bet I can do a 24 or a 26. So, you know, just buck up and put a small hook in the vise, get some fine thread and, um, and try it out. Cause believe me, there are times when you are going to want one of these tiny flies. And I never have enough of them in my box. Cause I don't really like tiny little tiny flies either. But, um, one of the reasons I, I, uh, tied this fly this week was that I have to practice. So I had to sit down and tie a dozen of them. So they'll have them in my box because <laughs> I know I'm going to need them. I know I'm going to need them. What do I do to keep track of my fly on the water? Is that I put fly floating on the leader, the last foot or two of the fly. Yeah, George, you, um, you can grease your, uh, put a little fly floating on your leader. I often do that, but just, Get out of that mindset that, that you're going to see your fly every cast because you're not. You're not. The lights, you're going to be in riffled water or the light's going to be bad. You're not going to see it. Get it out there. Be as accurate as you can. You know, if you've practiced your casting, you should be able to put that fly where you want it, even if you can't see it on the water. Now, the one thing you can't tell is if the fly's dragging, and that's often, often important. Um, but, you know, just keep practicing. Wax the thread before you finish. Keep the head secure. Yeah, that'll help, Mark. Definitely help. What do you do with a drunken tire? What do you do, do you do with a drunken tire early in the morning? Ha ha, Roger. <laughs> and Joe, don't be frustrated. This takes time. Um, just, just, just have fun with it. Take your time. You know, even if your flies don't look as good as Tim Flagler's, um, they're still going to work and you're going to take a lot of pleasure in, in catching fish on those flies you tied yourself. So, um, you know, be a perfectionist if you have to, but, uh, uh, good enough is, is usually gonna, gonna work for the fish. The fish aren't as picky as we are. Believe me. These days hooks are larger size for size than they were 30 years ago. In my opinion. Okay. I think the shank lengths are the same. Some of the some of the eyes are bigger and the hook gaps are bigger, but I think the shank lengths are the same. And Tony, also in um, in the old days, a lot of the tiny flies were um, tiny hooks were made by hand. Um, uh, the you know the old English hooks that were, they were made by hand, and there was a ton of variation in shank lengths. If you bought some tiny hooks in those days, uh, there were all kinds of variation in shank length because they were handmade. They weren't they weren't made by machine and computer. So there was, there was quite a bit more variation in those days. Do, you, do I have to use social media to contact you? Yeah, that's probably the best way, Thomas. Through Orvis, they'll, they'll get the message to me. Any other questions? Guess not. Well, we're done early today. But uh, again, a simple fly. So if, uh, if there are no other questions, uh, I will see you all next Monday at 3. Next. Uh, Mark, I already did a beetle. Uh, if you look back in the archives, um, prob might do it. Might do a beetle this fall. But... Uh, I know Tim Flagler did a really nice beetle recently on, on tight lines, so you may want to look at that one. And um, next, won't Pete be joining you? Yes, next next Monday we have a special guest, Pete Kutzer. Pete has a really cool. It's a oh. small. It's a small sculpin pattern that that Pete uses for swinging. Uh, but it also be an effective fly just for stripping or even dead drifting. So we're going to, we're going to tie Pete's um, space gulp in next week. And Pete's going to join me and, um, and talk me through it and yell at me and tell me I'm doing it wrong. So um, that'll be fun. And no, we haven't decided uh, 
the next Flagler tie-off. I can't remember. I think it's, oh, it's my turn, isn't it? Uh, maybe we'll do a beetle. Maybe we'll tie a beetle. I don't know. I thought we already tied a beetle. But anyway, uh, we haven't decided yet. And Thomas, no, we're not tying a royal wolf. No way. But the, but the next tie-off is October 11th. Not the, Octo it's the first Monday of every month, but it'll be October 11th. So, Tom, you got to gotta pick your, your poison there. All right. Okay. I got to think of a fly that Flagler doesn't like to tie. All right. Uh, I don't... I, uh, Mark, I don't know your question, fishing reds. I don't know what quite what you're talking about there. Redfish or reds like uh, R-E-D-D, -D, like uh, fishing over spawning beds. Um, if you can clarify, we can try to answer your question. That doesn't, uh, I, I'm not sure uh, how to answer that one. What is the lowest X size you would use for this fly? Well, 7X is kind of my, and, and I rarely use 7X, except if the fish are super, super, super spooky. Um, but I'm going to be fishing with a guy in a couple of weeks who claims you need size 28 and 30 and 8X on a particular tailwater. So um, I don't know if I'm going to go there, um, but um, I... I I don't use 8X and 7X it rarely, uh, rarely, 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 like maybe once a season, maybe once every other season. And that's only on uh, a couple of rivers where the fish are super, super spooky. And I, I use it more, I use it more, not because it's less visible, but because uh, 7X, a long 7X leader will just land lighter on the water. And if I fishing 6x and i cast to a fish and i see the fish bolt um when i throw a 6x tipping over the fish um that tells me that you know a 7 7x is gonna land a little lighter on the water and i may have to go to 7x but um, that would be only if the fish are relatively small too if the fish are going to be over 10 inches i'm just not going to 7x and if the water's warm, I'm definitely not going to 7X. I probably won't even use 6. I use 5 because it takes too long to, to get a fish in on those light tippets. Jorge, what's your favorite beer? Jorge, I am not a beer drinker. I love I love whiskey and wine and rum, but I'm, I'm just not. I don't have a favorite beer because I seldom drink it. So, <laughs> sorry. All right, everyone. Well, um, thank you for for coming in and and tying with me today. We really appreciate all of you joining us, and um, love your comments and your questions are great. And so, um, you know, keep the questions coming, and uh, try uh, stay tuned next Monday for Pete's uh, space sculpting. Thanks. <laughs>